You ever notice that the uh, closer you get to Christmas, people have a countdown? 25 days to Christmas. We don't do that with any other day. Nothing gets a 25-day countdown. 25 days to Thanksgiving, no. 111 days until Pastor Chuck's birthday. 111 days. Nobody says that. Usually get one of two reactions. Um, people over a certain age, they panic. How many days? How many days till Christmas? I'm never going to get everything done. I've got shopping. I have people to see. I have wrappings to do. I have cookies to make. I have to put up the decorations. I have visits to make. Who, who's like that here? Raise your hand. Come on. Raise your hand if you're like that. Okay? There's others who are a certain age, and you'll hear this. Just 10 days to Christmas? Christmas is so far off, it's never going to get here. Anybody here like that? Some of you don't know how to vote. <laughs> Anybody here secretly get your gift and then look at it and then rewrap it before Christmas and so the person that gave you the gift doesn't know that you opened it up? Anybody ever do that? My goodness, folks, you guys don't tell the truth about many things. <laughs> the Christmas season is, is about so much anticipation. It's built into it, both positive and negative. There's, there's excitement and panic. There's hope and fear. There's positive and negative. Maybe, maybe this Christmas is not a happy Christmas for you. Your life is full of problems and hurts, frustration, health issues, grief. You just heard, oh, holy night, my little boy. <laughs> but there was a line in that, and he said, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. So a lot of people who are feeling very weary today. In recent years, anxiety is up, depression is up, suicide is up. We are weary people. But the song talks about a hope in the midst of the weariness. So how, how can that be? You already heard the Christmas story that I shared with you from Matthew and from Luke. That's how it unfolded in the Bible. But let me share with you what I think one of the greatest passages in the Bible that tells us how we can have hope. Even when, when life and family and relationships and health and finances and mistakes and politics have stressed you out. The Apostle Paul wrote these words. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That says that the baby born in an animal feed box that holy night was not just any child, but Jesus. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. That's why Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the thrill of hope. And I have two thoughts about that that I, I hope will sink deeply into your soul this Christmas. The first thought is this. God is with you. You know, the, the older you get, Time just flies. Would you agree with that? How many people here were born in the 1990s and earlier? Raise your hand. 1990s and earlier. Keep your hands up. All right? Arm's getting tired, isn't it? All right? It's hard for us to raise our hands when we're that old. You're from, 
Think about, you can put your hands on. Think about this. You are from way back in the 1900s. <laughs> Kids born in 2010 are now teenagers. Kids that were born in 2001 have no recollection of 9-11. Now, those who were born recently, and I'll say from 2000 or so, will never experience this particular sound. Now, kids, that's how we used to have to dial up the Internet. You could go to lunch while that thing was trying to load. It took so long. You think that Wi-Fi has always been here, kind of like air. It's always been here. Here's something else that kids born since 2000 have never experienced. Now, this, this is how we used to spend Friday nights. You would, go to the, you would go to this Blockbuster store. It's a video store. They actually rented videos on tapes. And what you would do is you would, you would get two or three of these tapes, and you would go home, and you would watch them, and then you would go back home. You'd go back to the store. And, and this particular store, Blockbuster video store, they'd like you to rewind the tapes before you turned them back in. And so if you did that and you were a good customer, then they had a slogan, and the slogan was this, be kind and rewind. rewind. Some of you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Things are always changing. What is visible in one generation is invisible in the next. But Christmas reminds us that in our worry and in our anxiety and stress that God and his love remain unchanged. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can take that to the bank. Now, look at this verse again. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The Greek word, the New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek word for image is the word icon. You have icons on your phone and on your computer at home. Certain actors or athletes are icons to us. And Jesus is the biggest icon of all. He shows us exactly what God is like. He is the visible image. He is the, the visible icon of the invisible God. He is God's icon. Not the king of pop, but the king of kings. I'll even say this. Jesus is the most influential person in all of history. That's a pretty bold statement to make, especially in 2023. But that's my point. What is 2023? 2023 is cl it's close to 20, 2,023 years since the birth of Jesus. All of history is defined by the date of his birth. Minnesota has a capital city called St. Paul. Because Paul was a follower of Jesus. And Jesus called Paul as a disciple, as an apostle. California has its capital city, which is Sacramento. Because long ago, Jesus had a meal with his followers where he broke bread. And he, and he gave a cup. And it became a sacrament. It became a, a holy meal. North Dakota has a town called Fargo. Now, why is it called Fargo? Nobody knows. 
Nobody knows why. We'll move on. <laughs> Jesus never held public office. He never wrote a book. And yet 2,000 years later, it is impossible to imagine world history without his impact. This movement of Jesus led to the building of schools and hospitals and great universities, all originally formed to advance the Jesus movement. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, St. Jude Hospital, Good Samaritan Hospitals. The impact of this baby born in Bethlehem is irrefutable. He is the visible Image. He is the visible icon of the invisible God. And he grew up and he died on a cross as the ultimate expression of goodness and holiness and the love of God. And three days later, he rose from the dead and he unleashed the greatest movement that the world has ever seen. He's the greatest teacher who ever lived. He is the greatest he has the greatest mind who ever thought. He offers the greatest gift ever given. He is the iconic, visible image of the invisible God. And listen, he's with you. When you are weary, when you're lonely, when things look hopeless, he is the thrill of hope. Here's the second thought that I... I pray we'll be able to, to sink deeply into your soul. God is for you. So many people think of God like Santa Claus. Um, he's making a list and he's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. And he's watching you. He sees you when you're sleeping. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> and people think... Well, if I'm, if I'm good enough, God will love me. And if, I, if I'm on God's nice list, then I'm going to go to heaven in the next life. The problem is, the Bible says that none of us are good enough. None of us are good enough to be on the nice list. We all need a second chance. And that's what Jesus came to give. A couple of verses later in Colossians, Paul wrote this. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Heaven and earth, that includes you and me. He made peace. Now, how, how did he make peace? By means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's the source of hope. There's two kinds of hope in the world. One is when you place your hope in something, and the other is when you place your hope in someone. When your hope is in something, you, you hope for a particular outcome. I hope I get that job. I hope I get that house. I hope I get that girl. Or hope that girl gets that job and then gets that house. <laughs> and you never find lasting hope in some thing. Our hope is not based on, on what's happening in Washington, D.C., thank goodness. Or our marital status or the stock market or on your report card or our health or our reputation. Our hope is based in someone the perfect one who with his blood on the cross made peace between us and God. What you did in the past is not nearly as important as to what God did in the past. It says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, Created through him and for him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He holds. If Jesus holds all creation together, he can hold you together even when 
it seems like everything is falling apart. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morning. Do you remember what the next line is? Fall on your knees. The message of Christmas is that God is with you and God is for you. The question is, will you fall on your knees to receive it? Embrace it. Grow into the one that God is calling you to be. The Bible says that one day every knee will bow. Let me remind you who we worship and sing about that came to us centuries ago. He is painted in every single book of the Bible. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is the seed of David. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he is our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of everything broken. In Esther, he is our Mordecai, our advocate. In Job, he is our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning for life. In the Song of Solomon, he is the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the glorious Lord. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the outpourer of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is our judge and savior. In Jonah, he is the risen prophet. In Micah, he's the ruler of the world from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he is our stronghold. In Habakkuk, he is the watchman. In Zephaniah, he is the mighty to save. In Haggai, he is the restorer. In Zechariah, he is the branch of David, the one pierced for us. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. In Matthew, he is the king of kings, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he is the servant, miracle worker. In Luke, he's the baby in the manger, the son of man. In John, he is the son of God, the living word, the way, the truth, and the life. In Acts, he's the savior of the world. He's the ascended Lord. In Romans, he's the justifier. In 1 Corinthians, he's the resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, he is our comfort. In Galatians, he's our liberty. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, he's our joy. In Colossians, he's our completeness and the glue that holds our world together. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he's the coming king. In 1 and 2 Timothy, he's our redeemer and he's our mediator in Philemon he's our benefactor in Titus he's the blessed hope in Hebrews he's our perfection in James he's the power behind our faith in 1st and 2nd Peter he's the chief shepherd and chief cornerstone in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John he's our truth and everlasting life in Jude he's the foundation of our faith our security and revelation he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords he's the first and the last the beginning and the end the keeper of creation and the creator of all he is the architect of the universe and the manager of all things. He always was, he always is, and always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. That's our Jesus. That's who we worship this Christmas. And maybe life has, has knocked you down to one knee and you don't know what to do. What if you just drop the other knee this Christmas? We're going to sing Silent Night. We're going to have an opportunity to light some candles. I don't know if physically you can't drop to your knees right now. But you can do that physically if you want to when you get home. You can do that in your heart even while you stand and sing 
Silent Night. The whole reason for us being here tonight is for us to meet Jesus either again or for the first time. That's the whole meaning of Christmas. So the candles will be lit. And Sharon's going to play all four verses through. And then the last time after she plays the fourth verse, we will sing the first verse a cappella. That means without the piano. And as we get to the chorus of each time, because we want to honor this one that we're here to serve and to worship, I want to encourage you to hold your candle high. And hold it high and then put it down as we sing the verses. And we get to the chorus, raise it again. We raise it to Jesus. Would you please stand and let's sing. <coughs> Would you pray with me? Father, on this silent night, <coughs> this holy night, we ask that you would bless it and bless us and bless the days ahead. 
as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we live with and for you from this day forth. May we honor you with the way we talk and act, places where we go, the things that we do. May you be the one that we look up to and seek to serve, our Savior. This we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas.